Please be seated. So three verses. Can I stretch three verses into 20 minutes? You betcha. <laughs> There's actually quite a bit here, and we're going to kind of explore a little bit. So let the little children come. That's really an appropriate thing, except if you are in a maternity ward in the waiting room. You see, three men were in the maternity room waiting for their wives to have their baby. The first one, the doctor came out, and great news. She had twins, and the, the father said, amazing. I used to play for the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> About 20 minutes later, the doctor comes back out, and he says, great news. You've had triplets. I can't believe it. I work for 3D, 3M. <laughs> About that point, the third guy passed out. <laughs> so they revived him, and they said, what's going on? And he says, I work for 7-Up. <laughs> Let the children come. Maybe not. So I want to first, I want to, if you take out your Bible, and I want you to kind of look at some of the context of what we see here. So we start off in Matthew 19, and if most of your Bibles will have like a headline, divorce, at the top of uh, chapter 19. And what happens here is that they were setting a trap for Jesus as far as how well was he going to follow the law. And so they found a place where Moses had given a decree for divorce, and they knew that Jesus wasn't necessarily a fond, a, um, was fond of divorce. And so they set a trap for him. They were trying to figure out what is Jesus' opinion about that law, and what does it feel like? And then if you look after the three verses that we are about to talk about, you'll see the big context or the big bold letters that says, the rich and the kingdom of God. And so this rich man comes to Jesus, and how do I enter the kingdom of God? And again, it's about the law. I've kept the law. I've done everything I need to do. Can I enter into the kingdom of God? Have I earned my way in? And sandwiched in the middle of that is these three little verses, these three little verses where Jesus really tells these children, the kingdom of God is yours. The kingdom of God is yours. What have these children done to earn the kingdom of heaven? Nothing. Nothing. Now, I need to be clear here that children are not saints. We know that. Those of you who have children or have watched children for any length of time, you know that they can be ornery, that they, you know, if you watch a three-year-old, some of the most selfish behavior you've ever seen in your life comes out of a three-year-old. Yes? Right? But there's something about children that is endearing, that is fun, that is something that we, we, we even hold up in our culture. You know, you can have this serious movie going on or, or TV show, and then they insert this commercial where this kid says, I, w I want to be an Oscar Mayer weaver, and we kind of breaks the tension, and we're ready to go, and we're ready to hit the right. Kids have this ability to draw out the best in us. There's something about kids that's great. God loves children. Jesus loves children. This church loves children. So we get to this place where people were sending their kids to see Jesus. And it was common practice that they would send kids to see the rabbi, and the rabbi would bless them, and he would take the time to really make sure that all the kids were, he put their hands on them and he blessed them. It kind of reminds me if you've ever seen pictures of the Vatican when the Pope is, is walking around and he, people just want to touch him. They just, it was that way with rabbis and with children. So they would send children in to see the rabbi. Jesus was the rabbi, a rabbi of that time. And so they wanted Jesus to bless their children, to touch their children, to have co connection with their children. And sometimes the disciples get a bad rap here as they are rebuking the people who were sending the kids and saying, no, we don't, we don't have time for that, Jesus. We, gotta, we got stuff to do. I mean, you've been healing. You've been talking to people. We've, we're gathering folks. There's things that we've got to take care of. We don't have time for this. And I'm sure that at times we as adults fall into some of that same kind of category. We don't have time for this. One of the big events of our summer is VBS, and as we recruit volunteers, one of the things that always comes out is, I don't have time for this. 
And I don't know if it's because our schedules are too full or the way we view children or what it is, but sometimes we don't see the value of what it is to be with children and introduce children to Jesus. So the disciples get a bad rap, but I think they're really trying to do the right thing. They're just a little bit misguided a little. And so Jesus says, no, no, no. And he gives two very specific things that we're going to look at. First, he says, let the children come to me. Let them come. And then he says, do not hinder them. Similar, but a little bit different. Positive and a little negative. Let the children come. So what does it mean to let the children come? One of the things that I have been very proud about this church is is it's been a place where kind of the undergirding motto of what we do is let the children come. It's a big deal. VBS is a big deal. The youth programs are big deals. We invest money. We invest time. We invest people. We want the children to come and to know who Jesus is. There are statistics all over the place about children who come to know Jesus at an early age remain believers long after. In fact, it's easier for children in high school or in middle school all the way through to come to know Jesus than it is when you become an adult because you have these things that get put in your life and these beliefs that get stationary and stuck. So the opportunity to bring children in middle school and high school children to come and to be a part of what God is doing is so vital, so important, so that they might know who Jesus is. So what does it mean to bring them to Jesus? Come, let the children come. Well, some of it is as practical as bringing them with you when you come. And here I'm, I'm in some ways talking to the choir because you all have done this or are doing this. And sometimes we we make this decision that, you know, I don't know if I want my kids with me because I want to be able to worship. But the idea that they can see you worship, you as a grandfather, grandmother, you as as a parent, to have your kids watch you and imitate you and watch as you come before Jesus that they might want to come before Jesus as well. Let the children come. It's also, we can be examples Has your kids or your grandkids ever caught you having that quiet time with the Lord? When you pray for your meals, what do they hear? When you talk about Jesus, if you talk about Jesus, what do they hear when you talk about? Can they imitate you as far as your relationship with Jesus? Now, my kids have seen me talk about Jesus a lot. I was a youth minister and you've, many of you experienced me in that role. You've seen me here up front preaching. And one of the characteristics that I have, I don't know, it's a habit, is that I always have my Bible open when I talk about Jesus, whether it's to a bunch of students or whether it's to the congregation, because what I'm going to talk about usually comes from here. And so I have this open, and I'm talking about it, and we can walk through it this way. Well, my kids have witnessed that. When Josh was very young, he, we sent him to preschool to Nysonger over at Ohio State. And the teacher called up one day and reported that every day he would get a book and he would open the book and he would stand before the class and he would begin to talk. <laughs> and he didn't have full verbal skills at that point, so he would talk and every once in a while, Jesus would come out. So, I'm going to ask him, Jesus, and I'm going to ask Jesus. And so finally the teacher called and goes, okay, so is there, is there a preacher in the house? Is what's... <laughs> because he literally was imitating me in front of the youth group. As what he saw is what he was doing. What do your kids, what do your grandkids see? How do they connect your faith in their lives with what they see? Can they imitate you in your relationship with Jesus? And do you take your your faith seriously? Is it something that when you talk about around the house that they hear? And how often do they hear you talk about your faith and about Jesus compared to the Reds or the Guardian or what's going on in Washington, D.C. or gas prices or what a horrible place this is to be? 
or all the things that you don't like about church, or all the things you don't like about some of the things that are changing? Or do they hear you talk about Jesus and what he means to you in your life? What are they going to imitate as they hear you talk? Secondly, we hear Jesus say, don't hinder them. And now he goes a little bit negative. So bring them. Come on. Let's have them come. But he says, don't hinder them. Do we treat God's word casually? Do we treat church casually? Do we treat fellowship casually? Don't hinder them. Don't stand in the way of what God might want to do in those kids' lives. Back when we were doing youth ministry, we had a, a, a one particular parent who their, their kid did something that was, uh, they didn't like so much. He literally turfed several yards with uh, his Jeep, and the license plate was very distinctive, and so they caught him because it was, there was only one of those kind of license plates. It was a, a vanity plate, and it was very easy to figure out who had turfed their yard. So they caught him, and their parents punished him, and they punished him by sending him to a youth retreat with me. (laughs) Interesting way to punish somebody. Bad child, I'm sending you to church. And I thought, great, this is awesome. This is exactly the kind of kid that I want to come to the youth program. And not only did he get involved in the youth program, but he became a part of the leadership of the program. He became a part of the leadership of this church. He now currently is a part of another church and is part of the leadership of that church. All because he turfed a couple yards and ended up going on a youth retreat. Be careful. (laughs) So why would we punish our kids by by sending them to church or sending them to something like that? We had another um, part of our youth program whose mother was not a believer and so forbid her kid to come to church. And she was so upset and she wanted to disobey her mom and say, you know, can I just sneak over and be a part of the youth program? And so we met with her and we said, no. We want you to honor your mom. And we're going to witness to your mom by honoring her and we're going to take care of you in every way we can. And so we had some of the youth staff reach out to her and pray with her, and and pretty soon, her mom started to see a change in her and wanted to know what was going on, and she connected the dots, and pretty soon, she kept sending, she started to send her kid back to the youth program. Because we honored the mom's wishes by doing what needed to be done, and we showed the love of God for her, not just the middle school student. This person later on became a doctor, is now over in Dayton, is a part of a church, and is thriving as a believer. Don't hinder them from coming to be a part of what God is doing in this place or in in general with the kingdom of heaven. Life with Jesus should be a priority. Is it a priority in your life? If it's not a priority in your life, you are hindering your grandchildren and your children from coming to Jesus. And of all the different priorities that you have in your life, where does your commitment to Jesus stack up? Because it has an effect on those who are watching. And I tell you, they're watching. They're paying attention to do what you say and what you do match. Is there real connection with Jesus in your life? The last thing about the negative piece, I hear um, particularly younger people, younger families, some of them will say, well, I'm not going to push Christianity on my kids because I want them to make a choice. At that point, you have already helped them make a choice because you have said that Jesus isn't a priority, that Jesus isn't who he said he is. And so if you, you truly believe Jesus is Lord, if you truly believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then there is no other option but Jesus. And you need to be strong and stand your ground and let your children, let your grandchildren know that this truly is the way that Jesus wants them to come and be a part of what he's a part of. The last thing I want to talk about is the very last verse, or this last piece of it. He says, Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It's interesting he doesn't say it belongs to these, but such as these, which then I would interpret as 
folks who have a childlike attitude, who are similar, not childish, but childlike. And so there's something about being childlike that I think is important and something that we can grab a hold of. What sets a child different from an adult? It's not just size, but if you ever watch kids, they laugh, they play, there's an innocence about them, there's a trust about them, there's a curiosity about them that I think would play well for all of us to remember those things in our lives when we were children. That curiosity that is innate in us of wanting to know, you know, why? Remember that question when little Johnny would come to the table? Why? Well, because, the, well, why? And there's like 27 whys as far as, you know, and by the time you're finished with dinner, you're thinking, okay, I want little Johnny to go back home with his mom and dad. <laughs> but there's a curiosity, a curiosity to want to know what makes this happen, what makes this tick, where do we go with this? And what's it going to do for me? And how does it affect me? There's that curiosity that I think God wants us all to have. Who is Jesus? What does the Holy Spirit have to do with my life? Am I a part of the kingdom of heaven? What are my spiritual gifts? How do I contribute to the greater kingdom? The people even know that I believe in Jesus. A curiosity, that questioning, what is it about God that's so attractive? That sense of trust, where once a, well, a parent says to a kid they're good, and then the kid just goes and is a part of everything. I'm amazed to watch when VBS starts, that, that first, you know, maybe 10 minutes, there's a little bit of that on edge, and then once they feel comfortable, I mean, they are everywhere. There's this trust that they have of, this is a safe place. What will it take for you to get that trust back? You've been through a lot. There's reasons why you don't trust anymore. But these little children come and they trust because they don't have all of the garbage that has stacked up in their lives that they have kept them from really becoming who they really could be. And then that sense of innocence, that wide-eyed innocence, and it makes me sad watching kids lose that innocence when they experience things, see things, hear things that take it away from them. But I think God is calling us back to that innocence and that sense of dependence upon him. Not interdependence, but dependence that he is our father. He wants to take care of us. He wants to provide for us. Watching a kid with their parents is amazing to see where they will go and explore, and every once in a while they'll turn and look just to make sure that they know where mom and dad is. And as long as mom and dad are in eyesight, they're free to explore and free to figure out their world around them. Do we have that same relationship with God? Where as long as we know where God is, we're free to explore. As long as that relationship with God is solid, then we are free to figure out, what, what if I did this? What is, how can I risk and try this? Maybe I can actually talk to my neighbor about Jesus. I see Jesus, I see God, I know I'm safe, and I know I'm okay to explore and push and to figure out how to begin to do that. So as we think about the little children coming, how could we become more childlike? How can we become more like those little children to come to Jesus with trust, to come to Jesus with innocence and that sense of independence or dependence on him, and that sense of curiosity. I want to know as much about you as I possibly can. I think that's where Jesus is calling us to be a part of, calling us to actually help other kids be a part of that. So this week, as VBS begins, I would invite you to become childlike, to come and to play Wear a goofy hat and a goofy shirt and just play. Have fun. Don't worry about embarrassing yourself. We all are going to embarrass ourselves, and it's going to be okay. Be a child for a week. Come, explore, and please pray for the children, for the teachers, for the volunteers at VBS that we all might say, come to Jesus. Come and see. I think you'll find Jesus to be the most exciting person you've ever met.
Let me pray. Father God, I do thank you. I thank you for Jesus, and I I thank you that he asks all of us to come and to leave behind some of the stuff of this world that we might trust you, that we might be curious about you, that you might restore our innocence, that we might be dependent upon you. Thank you that you don't turn children away, but you invite them in, invite them to be a part of what you are doing, and that you bless them even before you get on with your busy day. So thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing together?